Jeff.com. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Kerry, it's great to be back with you, man. Hey, so, so recent article you wrote uh, about gold prices, don't worry, uh, China's got, got your back covered, basically. And, uh, uh, you know, like lately China hasn't, uh, other than when I was at the Chinese restaurant not too long ago and had a really great meal, they haven't really done much for me. <laughs> That's right. Well, this all started um, because it, well, it's true that the news about China and gold has really subsided. You know, it made headlines a few years ago um, for a long time, and, and then it's kind of subsided, hasn't really been in the headlines. And I read a recent re uh, report from somebody in the mainstream. I don't know if it was. Bloomberg or Reuters or whoever, and they were saying, well, you know, gold imports into Hong Kong are down again. And the author of that article concluded at the end, well, therefore, gold demand in China is down. And I just, I just did not like that. I, I got upset and it's like, this is not true. This is not accurate. The thing about the article is it reminded me of the old parable of you know, the, the blind men feeling the elephant, different parts of the elephant coming to different mm -hmm. conclusions. The thing is, the, you know, what the facts that were stated in the article are true. It, it is true that gold imports into Hong Kong had fallen month over month, you know, ooh, big news, you know. And but the thing is, you know, concluding that therefore gold demand is down is actually incorrect. And the article is very misleading. Um, it's incomplete. Um, and it completely misses the forest for the trees, for, as far as I'm concerned. It turns out consumer demand for gold in China was actually up. Right. The Reserve Bank in China actually added to the reserves, you know, the prior quarter. And what the author completely missed, and which I think people have to be aware of, and I, I think most of your audience already is, even more than this, you know, supposed, you know, Expert. gold analyst, you know, <laughs> yeah. is that China imports gold directly into Beijing. They've been doing this for years now. They also allow imports directly uh, by jewelers, by dealers, and at least 14 state banks that we know of. Mm -hmm. None of this shows up in Hong Kong imports. So for this author to conclude that, you know, uh, therefore gold demand is down in the country is just completely erroneous and overlooks the most obvious point about China is that they don't want us to know how much gold they're importing. They keep it secret, as they do with many things in, in you know, their uh, society. But uh Clearly, there's more gold going into the country, and there's more demand for gold. Uh, look at Chinese withdrawals. So I'm sure you've had other guests on to talk about, you know, withdrawals from the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which are physical withdrawals, which don't come back onto the market. We never see that gold again. And it actually lowers trading volumes in North America because that, that gold is gone for good. They're not going to sell. They don't buy and sell. They just buy. Mm. And Chinese withdrawals, even though they're down from their peak, are still two-thirds of global mine production. Right. So, you know, th this whole idea that, you know, gold demand is down in China is completely erroneous, and it, it, and it overlooks the forest for the trees. I, I think some of your listeners might be curious to look at that article and look at the last section called A Lit Fuse, and it talks about – you know, some data that could really ignite the gold market and uh, just completely overwhelm it uh, just from China alone. China is only one catalyst, of course, but um, I, I think it's really true that I'm not worried about the gold price because China's got my back. I, mm -hmm. That's really that's really the case. That's yeah. really true. Yeah. So and they don't even talk about how much the mines the captive supply in China is those mines, you know, they supposedly produced a while ago, 400 tons a year. And that just got totally absorbed by China, not for export, nothing. And of course, yeah, the they're the, think that. about it. China is the largest gold producer in the world. 
They have the largest in-ground gold resource that we know of, the you know best estimates. Um, they they don't export any metal, and mm-hmm. yet on top of all that, they spent since 2011. China has spent four billion dollars in overseas mining projects. In other words, they spent four billion looking for gold outside of China even though they're already the largest gold producer, have the largest in-ground resource, and don't export any meaningful amount of bullion. So that tells you what they think about gold and how important they think it is and how much more they want. They just, a Chinese company just acquired, who was it, uh, Nevsen, right? Which had uh, a little bit of gold left in uh, Eritrea, but had this uh, huge project I think it was in Slovenia, I want to say, but I wouldn't swear to it. Uh, you know, huge project, and uh, nobody's talking about that, right? Nobody's talking about that, and they're investing in a lot of just projects in general. They're not buying so much other producers, although, mm-hmm. as you just said, they, they do do that. A lot of this money is money that you and I and everybody else doesn't really see all that much. It's getting put into projects or development you know, phase assets, uh, junior companies, uh, property, things like that. So um, they're they're playing a long-term game with gold. So they're doing what you and I do when we buy a junior gold producer. We buy it to make a lot of money at some point in the future because we think it's a, you know, an asset that that may have, you know, a lot more gold. Yeah. They're doing the same thing. So (laughs) Very, very true. And... So, so the uh, taken in the context of uh, the real world here, uh, you know, they might be gone, but they're not forgotten here. <laughs> they're not even gone. Yeah, they're, they're not making headlines, and you know, uh, you know, th- this journalist who wrote this report is is just really missing the forest for the trees, like I said, and and uh, I, I think, you know, they're playing a long-term game. This, you know, just because they're not in our headlines doesn't mean that demand is down or their interest is, is lower now or anything like that at all. It's actually just the opposite. And I think, you know, one of the bigger catalysts that could come out of China uh, in terms of gold would be uh, an overnight spike in official gold reserves. You know, they keep adding little bits, you know. But don't mm-hmm. forget, in 2009, they made that huge announcement where they increased the reserves by 75% overnight. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I think it's obvious that they had been accumulating that all along. They didn't just buy it all of a sudden. And I think that's what they're doing now. They're accumulating more than they're telling us, a lot more than they're telling us. And we'll see another overnight spike in reserves, and we'll see another announcement. And, you know, in the right environment, that could really ignite the gold price. So, you know, all of this is just one catalyst for the gold price, too. When you put this in perspective and look at the big picture of, you know, what's going on in the world, this is just one catalyst. But uh, I I think we're going to see a series of catalysts for the gold price. And we'll see major steps up, you know, as, as the bull market goes on, whenever that starts. So, yeah. So, you know, that's just my opinion, but I think, you know, over the next two to five years, the the gold market is really going to be a lot more exciting and the price will be a lot higher than it is now. Well, let's see what happens for sure. So, because, these junior miners, they're just dying on the vine here, Jeff. Uh, you know, not a lot. They are, them. and I am, you know, very long on uh, the junior gold miners. Um, uh, I, I do think there's going to be a lot of value there at some point, but let's put it in perspective. This is December, right? So this yes. is tax loss selling. So Worth these point. things have been yeah. going down, and they've been going down even more than usual now be probably because at least for a lot of them tax loss selling because we see this every year it's a, sure. a known phenomenon so it's not all that surprising um, I've actually been trying to take advantage of that I've been doing some buying of, of these junior miners um, you know over the past so 30 days or so uh, trying to take advantage of the weak prices because again I I believe and and you know it's just my opinion 
But based on my research and my experience, in two to five years, these junior miners are going to just absolutely soar. So I think that's the place to be in the long term. Is it the place to be in the short term? Who knows? You know, but, you know, think about it. Where else are you going to go? So when you look at where else are you going to go? The stock market's in a bubble. Mm -hmm. Bonds are even in a bubble. Real estate clearly rolling over now. Everything I read is, is, Mm -hmm. you know, the real estate market is rolling over. Cannabis stocks are clearly in a bubble. Bitcoin was in a bubble and that bubble's burst. You know, I I don't know where else you go. Cash. I mean, I, I think cash and gold are the only places you can really go right now. Yeah, uh, agreed. So, hey, speaking of bubbles, so Bitcoin, I know we talked about it when last we spoke. Now it broke through. Uh, I was predicting the crash for a while. I wrote an article about it. In fact, December 25th, saying uh, everybody should sell half their Bitcoin if they haven't already. But you know, now it's really, I, and I said it was going to go down to at least 80% before it came back, which was 38.80. It broke 38.80. So technical support, 90% retracement from its peak would be right around 2,000. Uh, Is this thing just going for the dustbin of bubbles? Is that what's going to happen here? Well, I mean, full disclosure, I'm not a a crypto expert. Um, Some guys at Gold Silver Mm -hmm. are. Uh, you know, including Mike Maloney. Um, He will say he's not an expert, but he does know a lot about this market. He Mm -hmm. has studied it. Um, But, uh, you know, Bitcoin's what, 34, 3,500 as as we talk. And I would not be surprised in the least to see it go to 2,000. Um, It could even maybe go lower. The market's, you know, clearly in a downward spiral spiral right now. Yes. Um, and as a lot of us have said all along, including you, mm-hmm. what, 80, 90% of these cryptos out there are worthless. The cryptos. Uh, just mm-hmm. like the dot-com stocks yeah. that were, you know, trading at 400 times earnings in the year 2000 and went to zero. The amazing? same thing's going to happen with a lot of cryptos. So that's going to pull down this market maybe more than it needs to. So, um, I, I think the crypto market has a long way to go. Uh, for me, based on everything I've studied, I think the issue is going to be the barrier to entry. The average person out there, you know, doesn't have an easy, there isn't an easy way for them to buy, mm. you know, Bitcoin and all these other ones that are probably going to last. Uh, that barrier to entry has to really come down and, and be a lot easier uh, for the average Joe to just, you know, buy it like a stock. Mm-hmm. And you can't really do that right now. Um, so I think the industry needs to be cleaned out. Um, I do think 80 to 90% of these things not only will go away, but probably should go away. <laughs> yeah. And what you're left with will probably be the ones that can develop and move forward, just like tech stocks. You know, most of those went to zero, but the industry didn't die. No. It, it continued to develop just like the internet did. And I think that probably the same thing will happen with crypt- cryptos. You know, the thing is, I, I don't think it's the place to be right, right at the moment. Um, it's too speculative. It's too volatile. Um, I do own some, so in full disclosure, I do own uh, some cryptos, but um, uh, you know, I'm not looking to really add to that position right now. I'm, I'm more interested in, in buying gold and silver. So, yeah, well, I'm uh, predicting now that uh, there's a major flaw in the system here for cryptos. I think they're all going to zero the current crop because they, uh, I don't think they can be reprogrammed to defend against this uh, bug because it's not in the blockchain. It's it's in the nature of of the way transactions are distributed, the so-called journal and the distributed journal and i'm just saying these guys don't have what it takes to uh to really sustain the next all-out attack on cryptos uh which could come from multiple quarters hey you know we we've talked you and i so many times about about currency the power of a country to print its own money 
or a currency block like the EU. And they're just not going to willingly give this up, Jeff, right? I mean, they're not going to say, all right, well, hey, you know, the private crypto market works so much better than what we do here. Let's just not do dollars anymore. We'll just transact business in Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or or Raven or whatever it is. And you know that that's just not reality. It's just not going to work that way. And anyone who thinks it is, is deluding themselves. Over the long term, history shows that every fiat currency doesn't last. You know, yep. most have gone to zero other than the current crop that we have right now. Right. British <laughs> pound, the yeah. US dollar and some of the other longer term ones, they've all gone to zero. So, yeah. um, and even though the US dollar hasn't gone to zero, a lot of people don't know this, but there's been three monetary resets mm -hmm. just in the past right. hundred years in the US alone. So yes. that greatly affected the, the value of the US dollar. So uh, you throw on top of that, the fact that the you know central banks continue to dilute the value of our currency and that and even low inflation adds up significantly over time and you know you have a recipe for you know uh something that's not going to last and will probably lead to a crisis and will probably push gold and silver up all yeah. by itself <laughs> for sure and i think in that instance gold and silver still are your best uh, defensive tools against it because even when countries uh, screw up their fiat currency, at least in the modern realm, you know, they come back and they create a new currency and somehow they get the public to go along and then it goes along till the next thing. Look at Argentina. How many people, how many times are the Argentinians going to get snookered by their government and its uh, money yeah. printing, uh, ceaseless money printing capabilities? Right? It, doesn't it make you wonder? I mean, how many times have we seen that currency, the Argentinian peso, if memory serves me correct, uh, just crash and become virtually worthless? I mean, how many more times does that have to happen? <laughs> and, and yet it keeps happening, right? Yeah, the the fool me once, you know, thing, and, and they, they don't seem to learn from that, you know. Um, the scary thing about now that kind of makes me a little nervous just as a person, as a citizen, as an investor, is mm -hmm. that for the first time in history, all currencies are fiat. Yes. There's no currency backed by any commodity standard at all. Mm -hmm. And up until the current period, we always there were always some currencies out there that, that did have some gold backing or other backing. We don't have any of that today. So Correct. It, it, it makes me very nervous when I see the amount of debt that is just spiking everywhere all across the world and that all these currencies can just be diluted at will by central bankers and politicians. I don't like where this could head, which, of course, is, is one of the core reasons we own gold and silver. But it also makes me nervous because – the the fallout from this, the blow up, could be more extreme than it needs to be. Yes, and could be catastrophic. Uh, you know, when I talk about this, it makes me nervous, and and it makes me wonder: Do I own enough gold and silver as much <laughs> as I already own <laughs> relative to my net worth? How, do I own enough? Maybe and it's and, not possible. and that's the <laughs> question I actually honestly ask myself, not because I work for a bullion dealer, but because I'm just a real person who you know, can look at at all these things and, and, and see what is likely to play out, especially when you look at history and, and wow, this is not good. We're not in a, in a, in a good situation. It's very precarious and the world may not end, but it could get ugly. <laughs> yeah, it could get very ugly, very quickly. We've seen it before. Uh, we'll see it again in the future. I mean, nothing really changes, let's face it. So, so gold is definitely the buy, and uh, cryptos you better be careful of, because just because they've gone down 80% doesn't mean they can't go down another 80%. These things, bubbles, you know, it, these people who are diehard Bitcoin uh, proponents, Jeff, they remind me of the mid-16th century tulip farmers who were, after just seeing all of their wealth wiped out by the tulip bubble bursting, 
saying, oh, but tulips are going to come back. Look how pretty they are when they bloom. They're coming back, definitely, and I'm just going to increase planting in my field to get even more bulbs because I'm going to make even more money when they go back up. And, you know, even today, the price of uh, tulip bulbs has never recovered to its then uh, glorious heights. <laughs> yeah, very true. You know, look how long it took the NASDAQ to get back from the tech bubble that burst, you know. Mm -hmm. It took 15, 17 years, whatever it was. And then, it, you, you know, it took so long that you have to take inflation into account. So the purchasing power of that recovery had drained as well. So have they even got back to their purchasing power level that they had in 2000? I, I'm not even sure that they have. So, you know, the bigger the bubble, the bigger the burst and, and the longer it obviously would take to, to get back. So um, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I'm, I'm not buying cryptos right now and I am buying gold and silver. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like the proper move. 